thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak. It's a great pleasure. Rafa, one of the best conferences, not only food conferences, but conferences in the world. So uh, I'm really grateful to Michelle and Yana for giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, I, I guess the first couple of lectures are really to think about why is it we want to measure things? We, we all like to measure things, don't we? And I want to maybe challenge all of us a little bit about what is it we want to measure in the future and how are we going to do it? And I'll, I'll, I'll start off with, um, it's not a chromatogram. Don't be too excited. It's a graph and it is the increase in the world's population. And you can see it is rising dramatically. Now, if you want to start to think about what does that mean in terms of food, it means in the next 50 years we have to produce more food than we did in the last 500. That's not a bad challenge to start with. And of course we're doing this against a backdrop of unprecedented climate change. Every week there are more and more catastrophic weather events happening in different parts of the world. You just need to look at what's going on in California at the moment. We also live in an incredibly polluted planet and haven't we done a wonderful job in terms of really polluting our water systems, our air systems? And then we have an even bigger challenge and that challenge is about water. Currently about one third of the world is deficient in fresh water and very soon that will be two-thirds of the world will be deficient in fresh water yet we're expected to produce much more food and then we have the world's food supply system which is becoming more and more complicated and citizens have lost total connection with their food so i hope i've cheered you all up now <laughs> now as, as Jana said, I, I was the founder of the Institute for Global Food Security quite a number of years ago at, at Queen's University. And I have to think back in terms of when was food security defined? That was actually in 1996 at the World Food Summit. And, and that definition, I think, has stood us in very good stead for quite a long period of time. But actually, I've been thinking recently is, if I was going to form an institute now, it wouldn't be an institute for food security, it would be about an institute of food integrity. And I have produced my own definition of food integrity. This isn't the United Nations, this is mine. I did send it to the United Nations, they just haven't replied yet. <laughs> but when I, when I talk about food integrity, I talk about the seven principles of our food system, our global food system. And those seven principles are the food that we eat should be safe, it should be authentic, and it should be nutritious. The systems that we use to produce our food should be sustainable, and our food should be produced to the highest ethical standards. And then there's the two principles around protect and respect. We have to respect and protect our environment and all of those people who work in our global food supply system. So what I'm going to do for the rest of my lecture is go through the seven principles, talk about some of the challenges and some of the ways that we have to think and rethink how, as people who measure things, actually go about helping develop a world food system based on those principles of integrity. So in terms of our food is safe to eat, well, actually, some, in some parts of the world we're lucky and some parts of the world we're very unlucky. 2015, the WHO published the, the first global statistics about foodborne illness, and it really was quite shocking. Each year, one in 10 of the world's, po world's population suffers from some, sort of food, some sort of foodborne illness. Over 400,000 deaths each year, and one third of those are young children. So I looked at that statistic, and you, you think it's quite depressing. And actually, I think it's a gross underestimate. And I think climate change is by far the single biggest factor that we need to worry about. And I, 
I'll show this publication. This, this was led by uh, Rudy Krushka and a, a, a group of us started to analyse the data going back over a long period of time in determining how much of the world's food crops are actually contaminated with mycotoxins. For a long period of time, the figure of 25% was quoted. That was always attributed to the FAO. And we looked at that data to see, is it true or not? And actually, it is quite a valid piece of information to say about 25% of the world's crops are contaminated with mycotoxins, but that is above regulatory limits. When you look at true exposure to people, it's between 60 and 80% of all food crops now have some form of mycotoxin contamination. And, and when we looked at the data, it's very clear that rise is due to two factors. One is climate, and the second thing, we're better at measuring them now. So measurement shows the importance of measurement science as we go forward. So I've got to think about how did we previously do our analytical work and how have we think about doing analysis in a different way going forward to really try to reduce the data that, that's needed to make decisions, to, to, to change policy. So this is one of the concepts that we have come up with over, over a, a recent period of time. And this is a project that we want to do actually in China. And it is about doing multiple forms of measurement, collecting all of that data together on a digital platform, and starting to produce now what we call decision support tools. Because different organizations, be you a food business, be a government agency, you need different forms of data presented in different ways to help us all make the right decisions. So one of the examples I want to give you in terms of, of trying to improve food safety is looking at the peanut value chain in China, the world's biggest producer of peanuts. And the biggest challenge they have is in terms of mycotoxins, aflatoxins. And again, this is about collecting lots of different types of data sets, be it from, from satellites, handheld scanners, using um, portable mass spectrometry, and at different parts of the supply chain producing different decision support tools. <clears throat> Farmers need one form of, 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 of information in terms of when is it safe to harvest, when should they, we, they treat with, with fungicides. Those people who process food <clears throat> need different levels of information, and those who police the world's food system need different types of information. So it's forming these decision support tools. Now, my second principle was about authenticity of food. That is a map of the world's main trading routes for food. That is a map of the world's main trading routes of organized crime. Aren't they similar? And there is more and more evidence growing now that organized crime is playing a bigger and bigger role in the world's food system. And you think, surely not. Start to think about the economics. If you calculate the amount of money that is made in the world's narcotics trade, add to that the amount of money that is made in people smuggling across the world, that does not equal the amount of money that's made in food fraud each year. It's a $50 billion industry. So more and more criminal activity happening in different parts of the world. So I describe it as, as food crime, and it can affect lots of different types of food commodities. It can be about claims of food, whether it's organic. It can be where did your nuts come from? Are they free from, from toxins? It can be about the species of fish. Multiple different types of, of food products, food commodities are, are implicated in fraud. Now, how do we go about trying to detect, deter food fraud? For a long time, it was about targeted analysis. You set out to measure something in terms of um, somebody has added something to your food that shouldn't be there. 
But what we became very aware of is those people who cheat look to see what analytical chemists are doing and then try to find some way to beat the analytical chemistry tests. The melamine scandal in China is a perfect example where people were able to cheat the nitrogen test that went on in milk. So the approach that we have taken is to think about using untargeted analysis, untargeted metabolomics. In this example, we were looking at could we determine the species of shrimp? Could we also determine what part of the world that came from in one single analytical test? We started off doing untargeted metabolomics. From that, we're able to select a number of biomarkers which gave very good information about the species, about the geographic origin. And then you take those and then you put them into a targeted methodology. Targeted methodology for biomarkers might seem a very unusual concept to many of you, but my prediction is we will be doing much more of this in the future. So we'll go through a discovery phase, and then we will go to developing the uh, analytical methods that can be used in, in routine settings. Another project I've been involved in for the past number of years is looking to determine how you can detect fraud in rice. Over two billion people in the planet eat, eat rice each day of the week. There's a massive amount of cheating and fraud goes on it. And that young lady in the picture is using a handheld scanner at a marketplace in Ghana to detect whether the rice in that bag is, is genuine or fraudulent. Quite remarkable. And that is the use of portable diagnostics combined with chemometrics. And what we're now doing is in the EIT food program that, that we had a workshop on this morning is thinking about how we can apply more and more of this handheld technology to detect the adulteration or, or, or genuine nature of food right across food supply chains. Again, in the project that we're running in China, or would like to, is collecting lots of data, and this is now about the tomato value chain. And you think, why would you do measurement of tomatoes in China? Well, China is now the biggest producer of tomatoes in the world. And what we will be doing is collecting lots of data and again forming these decision support tools to, that each step of the value chain will know that the, the product that is coming to them is authentic and genuine. In terms of nutrition, that's my third principle. And I use this very complex algorithm. And the one stands for one billion people on the planet who are currently malnourished due to a lack of calories. The two is the two billion people on the planet who are malnourished because of too many calories. And what's the final two? It's probably a lot of us in the audience. And that is the two billion people who suffer from hidden hunger. And hidden hunger is the lack of micronutrients in our foods. Vitamins, our fatty acids, some of the elements that we need to have a healthy lifestyle. And our foods are decreasing and decreasing in the amount of micronutrients that are present. We've got to do something about that. There are lots of efforts now going on in terms of how can we change our food system and start to get more micronutrients. And a lot of that is about good measurements in terms of, of our soil chemistry. How can we drive micronutrients into our crops? How can we drive micronutrients into animal feed? Not for the benefit of the animal, but for the benefit of the end consumer. And also, how can we start to educate more and more young people about the importance of micronutrition? And again, it's about good analysis. Many of the facts that we think we know about the micronutritional quality of our food is wrong. And there's more and more examples where when you look at what it says on the, the label, it's totally wrong because those have been based on food tables that were developed 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we have to go back and start to re-measure a lot of those things that we, we thought were present in our food. 
In terms of sustainability, we have massive issues of water. We have massive issues about the use of agrochemicals. We have massive issues about loss of biodiversity. And you think, well, what's that got to do with me as an analytical scientist? And the answer is, well, there's a different form of measurement. And that measurement is called life cycle analysis. And this is really quite new to me until this year. And life cycle analysis is really calculating, measuring the inputs, the outputs from our food system, different value chains. And when I look at life cycle analysis, it, it reminds me of chromatography about 20, 25 years ago, because there's about 10 or 12 different models to calculate life cycle analysis. Each one will give you a completely different result. There is no way that you can compare. So what they might say in a life cycle analysis in, in the United States will be very different from Europe, will be very different from Asia. So here is a great example where people who are doing wonderful work need to think about harmonization of, 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 of analytical measurements. Um, In, myself and a number of people have, have come up with this concept of food that doesn't cost the earth. This is about producing food that's done in a fully sustainable way, in a carbon neutral uh, food system. And what we want to now think about, how do we measure all of those things, the soil health, the amount of emissions, the amount of water that was used, the, the, the impact on biodiversity. And we are going to come up with a labeling system labels that will go on food that will tell us these facts, and that has to be based on good analysis. We have to be able to stand up to that. We have many issues about the ethics of food. One of the great debates at the moment is, should we stop eating meat and should we start eating plants? That, that's a debate for a different day. I think what we have to think about is, how do we look after the animals that, that, that we consume, the, 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 the welfare standards of animals? How can we think about, is it ethical to use massive amount of agrochemicals, and there's more and more evidence to start to suggest that those are, have a ne negative impact on human health? And what about the use of antibiotics in our food supply system? It's, it's estimated now that more than 50% of all the antibiotics are used in food producing animals, more now than is used in, in human medicine. These are all issues about ethics. And what we have to start to do is think about measurement again. And this is again about moving diagnostics from laboratories to where food is being produced, doing food, doing analysis on farms. It's about individual measurements of individual animals, all of the work that's going on in sensor technology to look at track the health, the welfare of animals is quite amazing. But there's also the use of systems biology. And now we've embarked on projects to say, can we really tell the standards that an animal was raised to based on a systems biology approach? Are there markers there that will tell us if the animals were treated properly? In terms of our environment, I talked about some of the massive issues that are going on at the moment. We have forest fires happening in different parts of the world. We have issues about deforestation to produce different types of food crops. We have issues about the amount of, of environmental pollution we're causing due to animal waste. How do we start to think about measuring that? Because now people talk about we will only buy sustainable palm oil, for instance. As scientists, how can you prove it came from a sustainable palm oil system? Well, you can start to use the wonders of, 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 of digital supply chains and blockchains and so forth, but I still very much struggle in terms of how can we, as analytical scientists, start to help to prove that food is being produced in a sustainable way from sustainable food supply systems? And if you think that one's complex, this one's even more difficult. It's about respecting and protecting all those people who work in our global food supply system. The people who get paid the lowest amount of money in the planet for doing their job are the people who supply us with food. 
So you can see there's, there's already an ethical issue there. Two more maps for you. This is a map where most, where most of the world's food is produced. Primary agriculture. The darker the color, the more in, intense the work there is to produce food for us all. A second map, and this is a map of slavery in the world. Perfect fit. So in many, many supply chains right across the world, we rely in this room on, on people who are in bonded labor to produce low-cost food. If that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, I'm going to make it worse for you. All these children, they're producing our food. They're not getting an education. They're not going to school. They are producing our food for us. And here are some of the really big societal issues that we have going forward in terms of this, it's not right, this is not appropriate. And I believe there will be many scandals coming over the next few years about the use of bonded labor, the use of child labor in our global food supply system. What can we do about that? How can we start to measure whether food has come from, from, from a supply chain that uses some form of slavery? And again, I don't know the answer, but that is something that we need to think about as an analytical community. So still lots of questions in terms of how we analyze things, but not why, because I think we've got to think about those seven principles of food integrity. And the clever minds that are in this room have to think about how as we as a community can come together and really develop a world's food supply system based on the principles of integrity. And I call this the hub, the hub for global food integrity. And this is about multidisciplinary research because I think it's bringing the very best of, of analytical chemists, bringing it together with those people who are experts in, in digital supply chains, those with experts in law and ethics and bringing them all together. So I'm going to finish with, with an invitation to you. This is myself and my research group at Queen's University. And what we're saying to you all is come and join our hub for global food integrity. Thank you very much for your attention.